I will put on my mathematician's hat again. So this talk is about beauty in mathematics. And thank you for offering this subject because it made me think of the history of beauty. So I'm going to speak about the history of beauty, the concept of beauty in mathematics. Uh, unlike in other fields, um, the ideal of beauty in mathematics hasn't changed over the last 2,500 years. It's more or less the same. What the Greeks thought is beautiful, we also think that is beautiful. What has changed over the years is the status of beauty, namely how important, how much it is valued. So it was always valued. But there are two peaks to this uh, admiration, which is one is the, in the Greeks' time, and one is nowadays. Uh, let, let me just speak, tell about a bit about the history of mathematics. So the, the high day, heyday of, uh, math, of abstract mathematics started with the Greeks 2,500 years ago and subsided in the Dark Ages. Well, unfortunately, there are sometimes Dark Ages. Uh, I hope that we are not on the verge of one of them, but there are, and so until 1200, more or less, there was darkness in mathematics, as in other fields. And then the West got, to touch, got in touch with ancient mathematics via the Arabs and contacts with the East. So Marco Polo even brought some uh, mathematics to the West. And, but since then, since the 12th century until the beginning of the 20th century, Mathematics was deemed important if it had some touch with reality, some Im impact on reality, some application. Uh, now it is no longer. So let me just clarify one thing. Applicability and beauty are not contrary to one another, uh, absolutely opposite. The most beautiful uh, mathematics comes from physics. It turns out that the world acts according to deep mathematical uh, principles. Somebody, I think it was uh, Gauss, who said that uh, the nature obeys the language of mathematics. Uh, mathematics is, for example, much more beautiful than chess. Sorry for those who value chess, I, I do also, but because chess was invented by men and the rule of physics are there, and they are somehow deeper. And as we said, mathematics, um, beauty appears when there is something deep that we unravel. Uh, so, but nowadays, it's no longer so. You can have mathematics that has no application, and everybody values it very much. So, uh, strangely, mathematics, uh, until the 20th century, until the second half of the 20th century, mathematics diverged in many directions. So everybody knew his own expertise. And recently, in the last 50 years, mathematics has converged back, so all fields unite together, except for some that are on the side, and they're probably never going to be applicable. There is, there, is, there is mathematics of infinity, so infinity is a very important thing, but there is also mathematics of all, all kinds of infinity, large infinity, larger infinity, huge infinity. These are never going to be applied, but still they're very beautiful, and mathematicians value it, and they have jobs in universities uh, in that field, in those fields. So this is heyday today of uh, uh, mathematical beauty, but the more in impressive thing was the um, admiration of Greeks to, to beauty. So Greeks uh, were the first to study mathematics for abstraction, without any, uh, touch, any, any contact with applications. Uh, on the contrary, they thought the less applicable it is, the more beautiful it is. Just as in life, they thought that the more a person is detached from work, the more valuable he is. They, uh, the great moralists, uh, Aristotle and uh, Plato, uh, claimed that, say, that, uh, that workmen, laborers, are worthless being more or less, beings more or less. And some, one of them even claimed that uh, slaves are better off than laborers. Why? Because they are in touch with the 
those lazy people who don't do anything, the free men, as they said. So they had great admirations for beauty, great admiration for uh, abstraction, and uh, they invented things that at that time were thought to be totally useless. Uh, one of them is the notion of axiom and proof, something that is so essential to us today in mathematics. It was new then, and it had no application, but uh, of course it led the way, it, con uh, it uh, it's, uh, pointed out the way for the entire mathematics for the next thousand, 2,000 years. And the other thing was constructions by ruler and compass, okay, that's in, in geometry, something that looks totally uh, devoid of any applications. It turns out that both things that are, were studied then for their beauty are very important, this, axiom, this notion of axiom and uh, uh, proof, of course. And then they, for example, they tried very hard to prove what is called the fifth axiom of Euclid, which is that for every line and every point outside the line, there is a single line going out, a single parallel line going through that point. Okay, that was considered, this was the fifth axiom, and they asked themselves and worked really very hard to know whether it follows from, whether it's an axiom, namely you don't have to, to prove it, or you can prove it from the other axioms. No practical implication to this question, but they were really uh, determined to, to determine it, to find it out. And it turned out that this was very, very important. In the 19th century, it was settled eventually, and it was decided that you can assume this axiom that it's true, and you can assume that it's false. And this started a very important a, a very important branch in mathematics called logic, and logic is really important because it's, this is what uh, led to the invention of the computer. The computer was, uh, was uh, invented uh, following the understanding that um, human thought is uh, can be mechanized, and the lo logic was the starting point for that. And the other thing, the, the construction by ruler and compass, was also turned out to be extremely important, and it led to the field of modern algebra, as they call it. But the most impressive guy in this uh, admiration for beauty was Pythagoras, who had a cult, very strange, the first and last probably, mathematical cult. There, was, there were a few hundred people who admired mathematics, and in particular admired numbers. How come they admired so much numbers? So it's a nice story, uh, Pythagoras, was walking one day, I don't know where, in, the, in his island, and, <laughs> and he saw there a blacksmith hammering some rods. And he noticed that if one rod was doubly the length of the other, then they sounded well, the noise that they made sounded well together. Or if it was a proportion of two to three, a nice proportion, a simple proportion, they sounded well together. Nowadays, we know the reason the frequencies are uh, related, so it's two to three, and in the 19th century, Helmholtz explained why this is beautiful. Why this is beautiful? Because there is order there. What is the order? Uh, the frequency that you hear here, when, when it's, you hit the rod of one length and the, the one with three halves, have similar fre higher frequencies that are common to both three times this and two times this are the same. So you hear something common to both, you find order in that, and that's why you feel that this is beautiful. But this um, discovery made him believe that numbers rule the world. He said even that the world is number. I don't know what it means, but uh, he said this thing. And he believed that the planets, for example, move with, uh, around the sun. I think he knew that the planets moved around the sun with radia where ready, which are num the numbers of the lengths are um, relate to each other in simple numbers. It's not true, but he believed so. And uh, when he discovered that there are, uh, th there are, side there are sizes that are not rational numbers, namely they are not a number divided by another number, they were shocked. Uh, and they swore never to, to 
discovered to relieve it, release it to the external world. They thought that this will shock the world. And one guy who uh, revealed the secret to the world was actually killed by them for this sin. And my time is up. That's what the screen says. So thank you very much. They left it here. Yes, it's here. So you can. Yes, that's what you want. Yes, another one. Yes. I chose one of these. My okay. This one's working. All right. Uh, today we have been instructed to talk about uh, the idea of beauty throughout history, and I'm going to do a little bit of that for philosophy. But I also want to talk a little bit about Ron's book, because uh, you may remember yesterday Yale recommended it highly, and through the magic of Amazon Kindle, I opened up my computer on the spot and ordered it. And then after the conference, I read it for a few hours until the jet lag hit. I'm about halfway through now, and I look forward to finishing it tomorrow morning. It's a magnificent book, and it's already started to change my thinking about a couple of points. Now, uh, there are a couple of virtues to this book that are relevant to what we're talking about here today. One of them is that uh, Ron gives a sort of unified field theory of mathematics and poetry, and you've been hearing him talk about that this morning. It's also a great pedagogical introduction to mathematics. If you've lost your childhood fascination with math mathematics, this book will help reawaken it, I think. Now, he talks in the book about how both poetry and mathematics are linked with certain features they have in common, such as compression, surprise, the play of the abstract and the concrete, and I think I'm forgetting a few others, but there's a nice list in the book. But let's go back, uh, to talk about the theories of beauty in the history of philosophy. Uh, Plato, of course, is a great theorist of beauty, and you may recall that Plato believes there's a world of perfect forms as composed with this world, uh, compared with this world of bodies. And uh, nonetheless, beauty for Plato in this world is a, including the beauty of, the erotic beauty of bodies is enough to stimulate our love for the perfect forms and to uh, point us towards this other perfect world. It's interesting, however, that unlike Ron, although Plato was also a great lover of mathematics, he was not a great lover of poetry. Poetry comes in for severe criticism in his dialogues, primarily because he thinks the myths of the Greek gods are morally corrupting for the children and should be suppressed. Um, and so Ron is already doing something Plato wouldn't do, which is to put mathematics and poetry on the same good side of the fence. Um, it was Aristotle who liked poetry. And Aristotle, of course, favored science over mathematics. And you might wonder, how can you favor science over mathematics? Isn't, aren't science and mathematics inextricably intertwined? Well, in the modern period, yes. Uh, but there was a sense before that that mathematics was dealing with the perfect world. Uh, the natural sciences were dealing with the corrupt world of bodies that are not immortal, they decay. And uh, it was really Galileo who uh, ended this idea of two different laws, one law for the perfect things in the sky and the other law for the corrupt things on the earth. And so in a sense, the marriage of math and science is a largely modern phenomenon. Obviously, mathematics were always used in astronomy, but there was a sense in which astronomy was not regarded as a natural science because it dealt with the perfect realm of the heavens, whereas nature was about these corrupt things on the earth. All right, now Ron actually goes so far in his book as to say that mathematics is essentially devoted to beauty, and he makes a very memorable case for that in the book. Now one question I ask is whether science is also essentially devoted to beauty. And I ask this for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that in my keynote following this, following the, the coffee break, uh, or, or maybe it's after, no, it's after the coffee break, that I will argue that beauty is the opposite of literalism, and there's a sense, however, in which science has a very literal aspect to it. It's trying to teach you real truths that can be stated in prose terms about the natural world. So one question is, that's one reason to ask whether science is compatible with beauty in the same sense as mathematics is. I also am uh, remembering a very amusing remark by Slavoj Žižek, who often makes amusing remarks, who jokes in one of his books about how the relation of art and science to beauty has reversed. So now it's the scientists who are always talking about beauty. So Brian Greene writes a bestseller called The Elegant Universe. Whereas artists, uh, like architects, often don't wish to be caught dead talking about beauty. This seems kind of naive to them. And so you get a work like Damien Hirst's A Thousand Years. If you don't know this installation, it involves a 
the, the head of a dead bull, and this draws flies in, and then the flies are electrocuted when they come uh, to this, are attracted by this head of a dead bull. And so there's nothing really beautiful about this. As Zizek puts it, uh, science is now concerned with the beauty of the cosmos, and art is concerned with a contact with brute reality. That's what real art is about now. All right. But again, is science as, as deeply devoted to beauty as Ron shows mathematics is? And if so, is it only to the extent that science partakes of mathematics? Is there anything specifically scientific that partakes of beauty? And the reason I ask this is because often when scientists talk about beauty, they're talking about the beauty of equations. I'm thinking, for example, of Einstein's letter to one of his friends about how beautiful the equations for gravity are in general relativity. You'll be amazed by how beautiful they are. Uh, the, uh, in James Watson's The Double Helix, there's a point where he says, uh, the double helix structure is too beautiful not to be true. It must be true. But these are already somewhat mathematical conceptions of beauty. Would you say the same thing about, say, Darwin's theory of natural selection? I suppose you could. I suppose you could say there's a certain elegance and economy to natural selection as an explanation for all the, the variety we see in nature. But it's not quite as clear as it is in the case of the mathematical side of the sciences. Now, uh, there is certainly something beautiful about unifications in nature, such as Newton unifying the phenomenon of the moon orbiting the earth and, the, and an apple falling to the ground. But this is already a mathematical kind of beauty rather than a specifically scientific kind. Kepler's theory of the elliptical orbit of the planets, again, a mathematical theory coming from uh, conic sections. Is there a sense then in which science, apart from its mathematical aspects, is able to go beyond literalism and partake of the beautiful? Now, what's wrong with literalism? I'm going to get into that in my keynote a bit, but literalism is the idea that something can be paraphrased, that you can take something and repeat it in other words that essentially say the same thing. There are some problems with this. Uh, we know, for example, that you can't paraphrase a globe in terms of a map. You can't flatten the globe and get, get it onto a map without distorting the size or the shape of the countries. A decision has to be made about how to project the globe onto a two-dimensional surface. And uh, it's been known in literary criticism since at least the 1940s that you can't paraphrase a poem. You can't take a poem and give a prose equivalent of it without distorting it in some way. Uh, in philosophy, Max Black and Hosea Ortega y Gasset even earlier said the same thing about metaphor, that metaphor cannot be uh, cashed out in terms of a prose statement that says exactly what the metaphor does. And uh, Ron also gives a beautiful example along these lines in his book when he talks about missing persons reports. I love this example. He talks about the uselessness of many of the reports. There's a missing person with, I think he says, gray hair and an athletic build, early 60s, kind of a thin nose. You're never going to find that person, right? There's so many people who look like that, you can't really visualize that. But if you say the missing person bears a strong resemblance to President George W. Bush, suddenly everyone's going to be on the lookout for this person. There's something different about there that's not just a collection of qualities that allows you to form a kind of gestalt of the missing person and be on the lookout for them. Um, another aspect of this is that criteria can't really be given for beauty, even though in Ron's book and elsewhere we can make uh, theoretical uh, approximations to what beautiful is. We can say compression and economy of energy and so forth. But that doesn't mean you can take those criteria and automatically produce beautiful works. Otherwise, everybody will become a great artist after reading Kant, right? And I'm going to give an example here um, from the eminent art critic Clement Greenberg, who dominated art criticism in, in America in the 1950s before becoming unfashionable after that. But I still have a lot of time for Greenberg. He cites, first of all, the opening four lines of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which are, of course, about April. To remind you, April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the deadland, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. And then he finds another four lines about April from William Watson, a lesser known British poet of the 19th century, which goes, April, April, laugh thy girlish laughter. Then the moment after, weep thy girlish tears. And the question that Greenberg asks is, well, the first, Eliot seems by far superior aesthetically, but why is it? If you try to specify exactly why it is, you have a difficult time doing that. You have a difficult time giving criteria. Uh, is it that uh, Eliot's is unrhymed and unrhymed poems are always better than rhymed ones? Not at all. Some rhymed poems are better than, than unrhymed ones. Is it that Eliot's uh, emotional tonality in his is kind of grim and foreboding, whereas Watson's is kind of cheerful and light? No, because cheerful and light poems are sometimes better than grim and foreboding ones. You can't say one or the other is better all the time. No criteria can be given 
for why Eliot's lines are better, and you have to use your taste, which is an idea Greenberg borrows from Kant. The idea that you cannot translate the experience of aesthetic taste into something conceptual. Uh, you lose something in the process. You cannot literalize. Uh, Zizek makes another funny remark about the Shakespeare Made Easy series. If you know this series, it is Shakespeare on the left and plain American English on the right. So on the left, it'll be Hamlet saying, to be or not to be, that is the question. And on the right, it will say, right now my problem is, should I kill myself or not? Which is obviously a literal equivalent, but you've lost something. Now, uh, what I like about Kant's theory, what attracts me in Kant's theory, is the idea that beauty is somehow incommensurable with any conceptual knowledge you can give of beauty. And I've generally been persuaded by that. However, Ron also has a good point in his book, uh, which is that there's something convertible about beautiful, the beautiful in knowledge, at least mathematical knowledge, that somehow the, uh, the beautiful, elegant formulation is the very essence of mathematical knowledge. You're talking about Erdos's notion of a book in heaven that contains all the most elegant proofs for any given theorem. And there's something to that, too. So how do you put these two together? And of course, the etymology of mathematics is the learnable, which suggests that uh, the be beautiful can be the learnable as well, not just that which is incommensurable with knowledge. So I'm interested in ways to combine these two somewhat contrasting insights. And I look forward to discussing this with Ron. Thank you. OK, so. Thank you for the kind words again, and for the propaganda for my book. It's very nice. Okay. I'm sure you have questions for each other. My uh, willy brain right now is <laughs> not helpful. Yes, I, I have another question for him from the book. Um, you, just, you talk in the book about how the death of Schubert is more tragic than the early death of a mathematician, because those mathematical truths can be discovered by someone else. Mm -hmm. Although you do say that if Gauss had published all of his work in his lifetime. <laughs> this is a claim. It's not, <laughs> yeah, so there is a claim by somebody called, I think, Bell, it was, who claimed that uh, th th there was a great mathematician in the 19th century called Carl Friedrich Gauss, the greatest mathematician people say of all time, and he was uh, enclosed in, uh, in the Gettingen, how do you call it, uh, stars, how do you call it, uh, observatory, and didn't communicate with the world, and people sent him letters with their discoveries, and he would answer, well, I know that, and they <laughs> didn't have anything, they couldn't do anything about that. And he really knew it because, and he didn't um, publish much, or, or didn't publish at all, and they claimed that if he did, then mathematics would advance by 50 years, but only by 50 years. It's not that his uh, discoveries would never be discovered. 50 years later, and I don't believe it. it's probably more like 10 or 20, yeah. So why do you think it is that uh, Schubert's death closed the path permanently and Gauss's death did not? What is, what is the essence? Because that it's, it's very simple. Because mathematics you discover, you do not even invent. Music you invent. Nobody can invent anything that Schubert had in his mind, only Schubert. But in mathematics you discover. If you don't, then somebody else would. Although I remember at the time, uh, maybe 15 years ago or so, when that eccentric Russian mathematician proved the theorem in topology, whose name I've forgotten. Poincaré's conjecture? Yes. Yes. I remember some, some mathematician at the time saying, if he hadn't solved it, it might never have been solved. Oh, I don't believe that. You don't believe that? Okay. No, 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 no. There are infinitely many geniuses. It's something that strikes me. There are so many geniuses in the world. Okay. I mean, you'd think that genius is, is something unique, but there are hundreds, and that's enough. I mean, look at those fantastic musicians around. I mean, those, those people who can um, memorize uh, operas uh, and they will tell you every note in, in all the operas of uh, all the great composers, they're geniuses. And the same goes in mathematics. And um, they would discover, they would discover, definitely. And I suppose you would say the same for natural science, that if Einstein had died before general relativity, uh, it, or is that is different? A, this is a hard okay. nuts, Difficult question. <laughs> because he was a real, that was really some discovery, but I believe so. Okay. So uh, actually, what happened was that a mathematician called Hilbert worked on the general relativity. They, they competed with each other, mm. and Einstein won. But, uh, uh, but the general relativity, which is the harder one, would be discovered by Hilbert a few years later. He was just slower and, I don't know, understood physics less, but it would be discovered. Just a matter of years. Yes, a few years. 
Yeah, in the double helix, there's also uh, an afterword written by Francis Quick where he tries to estimate how long the competitors would have needed uh -huh. uh, to discover the double helix themselves. And it was also a few years uh -huh. only. Yes, definitely. Now, I wonder about philosophy because I tend to think... I tend to think of philosophy as not just the discovery of truths in the sense of mathematics and natural science. I tend to think there's a poetic element there, that if, if Plato had not lived, philosophy could have taken a different path. But that's just a conjecture on my part. I don't have any grounds uh, for that. I agree that philosophy is not a science. Okay. It's, it is, there is lots of art in it, uh -huh. to the better and to the worse, because it claims to give us knowledge of something, and art doesn't. Schubert didn't tell us, well, I know this and this is true, and uh, you there don't even try to contradict me. No. And philosophers do claim to have some important truth. And sometimes it's art, isn't it? What do you think? I, I think also art. And uh, I think there are especially four philosophers who rise above the level of others as artists, and Plato is one of them. Mm -hmm. I think... Uh, literary, literary wise, I mean, he was a good, uh, good writer. In terms of literature, I'd, I'd yes. put Nietzsche up there, maybe Bergson and maybe uh, Giordano Bruno. Giordano Bruno, writer. oh. Yeah, wonderful writer. Yeah, really? Uh -huh. Even the more limited. I didn't know he was a philosopher even. I oh, thought yes. he was, yes, okay. Yeah, he has a whole cosmology based on the one and Neoplatonic philosophy. Uh -huh. I know he's very famous for other reasons in, in, yes. this, in science. Yes. Um, his view of the infinite number of worlds with, with intelligent creatures uh -huh. on them. Um, so what's interesting is you unify mathematics and poetry as both being concerned with beauty and yet one kind of beauty is discovered and another is invented. That's fascinating. Uh -huh. So I, I have, a, con I have a, a paragraph there about a claim that some woman uh, who was both a mathematician and a poet, I forget her name right now, she's, she's famous for, for being a good mathematician, she claims, well, it's the same for me, mathematics and poetry. I discover both. They were there. <laughs> Which is, I mean, it's a bit of a strange claim, but um, actually it may be true. So this beautiful metaphor, perhaps it wouldn't be ever discovered by every, anybody else, but it was there in some sense. I mean, this similarity between two structures did exist. So. And, and you talk a lot in your book about independent discoveries of the same point made by different people. Right, um, which is uh, evidence that you discover. And I wonder if there are examples of that in the arts <laughs> to as striking a degree as there are in mathematics and sciences. In the case of physics, I think of the which, second law of thermodynamics, I think it is, which was discovered by about four people around the same time. Many, many things were discovered uh, right. simultaneously. But the structure in the, the composer's mind is so complicated, nobody else can, can else can duplicate it. The same goes for poetry. They think differently, so they couldn't duplicate it, I, th I think. Okay. Uh, unless they would copy, which would be horrible, of course. Right. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, we have... Not so much time, but uh, there is a question that I always want to ask philosophers. Uh, why do you think that the question, what is beauty, is philosophical? I mean, let me just say it. I think it can be viewed as empirical. Just look at people, and empirical is contrary to philosophy. To mm -hmm. philosophical. That would you agree. Uh, so you just look at people look to what structures in the world they react as beautiful, they say it beautiful, or react in many ways that uh, characterize uh, reactions to beauty, and find the common denominator. Why is it philosophical? It's philosophical, first of all, because there are still differences of interpretation of that empirical evidence. Mm. So, for example, you talked about the evidence that people prefer symmetrical faces and view them as more beauty. That's interesting, but Kant would say that the beautiful face is not a pure beauty because it's somehow mixed with desire on some level. Uh -huh. He also says the a beautiful horse, same sort of thing. A beautiful horse is connected with the idea of being fast and powerful. And he says ultimately the same about architecture, that a beautiful building isn't a pure beauty because it, it's mixed with utility. And so he thinks we can't look at the case of a human face as a pure form of beauty. We have to look at things towards which we are totally disinterested. And that's the kind of thing that just an empirical approach couldn't get you. You'd need, you'd need philosophical considerations to make that distinction he's making. He could be wrong, of course, but that's, that's his way of approaching beauty. Um, 
actually, it's also a question for Taylor. Uh, what, what would stop you from just looking at which areas of the brain light up when people react to beautiful things and saying, ah, I've solved it. Beautiful is that which activates this part of the brain, period. I guess he doesn't have a microphone, so he can't answer. Let me answer. The question is, how does he do it? I mean, OK, this is the, that region. But what happens on the way to that region? Yes. I, mean, I hope I didn't get it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, okay. I have one little question. The architects in the end of the 20th century were talking about the authenticity. And still, authenticity is a kind of a value that is very dear to them. Uh, uh, the word truth, obviously, was dropped. And uh, perhaps, as Ron said, uh, the truth you know, in architecture can be as truth like in poetry, or as true as uh, mathematics or physics, right? Because it's about the world. So can you say something about ver true versus authenticity? Is there, is there, is there two words that one can compare? The like, what's the, the difference between true and true situation and authentic situation? It's hmm, a tough one. Um, well, in one sense, there are certain things that are copies and simulacra that can also be true in a certain sense. Any model of something that's a good model is not the genuine thing, in fact, but it could be more true. Sometimes the model of a thing is more true than the, uh, the original, I think. Um, I'm struggling to find a good example here on the fly, but... Um, Sometimes the inauthentic is more true than the, the authentic. Sometimes you need to pass from the, the authentic to the inauthentic to get back to the real authenticity. So an example would be that we all are ourselves, and then we go through life and we lose ourselves trying to copy other people and imitate them. And yet through that process, you begin to understand what you are. Through experience, through feedback from others, you begin to understand yourself better through being alienated, as it were, in your interactions with other people and finally coming to understand yourself through other people. Mm. Yes, I thought that... Okay, we have to... Time is up. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, I think there's an uh, interval right now, and then we'll continue with yeah. uh, Gorham's uh, keynote lecture. Thank you. But do read his book. <laughs> Thank you.